Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Sunday Mornings with Mike. We're with Mike Handler here, who is the Emergency Management Director for the Town of New Canaan. My name is Peter Walsh. I'm the Rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. I wonder if we might start with prayer, and I ask, I'm going to pray out of uh, our, my tradition, but I ask that you pray out of your tradition. And if you have no tr tradition at all, I ask that you take a moment and bow your head and uh, send your energy uh, to those who are in great need here this morning. Let us pray. Uh, keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night. And we ask that your prayers for them might be particularly this morning. Give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. So, Mike. Uh, welcome back. This is our fifth conversation, which seems unbelievable. That means one month has gone by since when we first spoke. Uh, it's incredible what has happened in a month. It's even more incredible what's happened in six weeks uh, when we were still trying to figure out what this thing was, and now we find ourselves uh, in a completely new world. I wonder if we might uh, start this morning with uh, all just a shout-out to all those anonymous people who are not in leadership roles, who are uh, showing up to clean the rooms at the Waveney Life Care Center, who are uh, bringing in the meals, who are uh, you know, just doing their jobs, uh, the UPS people who are traveling about, the people who are uh, serving us in our grocery stores and in the, in the supply chains, and just a, just a word and a, uh, about all of those people who are putting their lives at risk in some sense, uh, that we might eat, that we might have medicine, and that people might be cared for. So I know that you're in touch with a large portion of those people, too. Just a, a word about that? Yeah, I think the uh, term essential uh, worker is something that's been redefined and clarified for a lot of people. Uh, I think doctors and nurses, and rightfully so, get a lot of um, attention and focus. But after every patient that's treated in a hospital, someone's cleaning that room, someone's taking away medical waste, somebody's actually making sure that it's ready and available for the next person to come in. Um, and those people are often forgotten, but those are very much essential workers. And I can tell you that um, all the way up and down the supply chain of truckers and people that transport foods, pack foods, stock shelves, um, if you think they're not in harm's way by being at work right now, you're wrong. Uh, we are seeing uh, instances of infection uh, among those essential workers up and down the scale. So yeah. it, it's, it's a challenge. Um, maybe this is a force for good. Maybe after this is all over, we'll start to recognize and appreciate the full spectrum of essential workers, and they'll start to get different, uh, whether it be you know, financial or uh, rewards uh, commensurate with the risk that they're taking. But it's, it's definitely essential. You can't run a hospital without those workers. You can't run a, a nursing home without those workers. You can't run a food supply chain in a grocery store without those workers. So. Um, it's important. I think if you look at our grocery stores as an example, our frontline cashiers, mm. they're exposed to the most people we have in yeah. town. So they're seeing almost everybody shopping coming through their register. Right. So um, I'm not always sure that their um, financial incentives are in line with the risks that they're actually taking, but it's important to look at. Well, the sociologists are, are telling us and teaching us that the socioeconomic issues here are not fair. Uh, and there are many people that uh, at, the, at the lowest level do not have any other options but to provide and to keep going out and uh, to exposing themselves. And I know that uh, everybody out there would agree, anytime there's news that somebody from a grocery store has died, there's a, there's a pause in our hearts, uh, the anonymous folks who, who are really, really working to keep us, to keep the sure. rest of us supported. And there's, there's also a group of people that we don't even see. I, I mean, teachers uh, are actually home watching their kids and teaching our kids at the exact same time, which has never really happened before. Yeah. So there's a, a whole lot going on behind the scenes that I think um, at some point we're going to have to show a whole lot of appreciation for. Yeah, well, uh, uh, again, we have all these issues of mental health, uh, people with bad news locked in their houses for long periods of time. Uh, sheltering at home is not always a safe thing for everybody, as Correct. we know, domestic violence. And, of course, we have all these issues of working parents who are trying to do their job and uh, homeschool their children, uh, and in some cases, it's literally just too much. It's just too much. Yeah, and we're seeing that. I think uh, the community is seeing um, 
domestic violence and, and stress uh, from the home isolation and quarantine kind of orders taking their toll. Yes. I think it's, it's very tough because um, the teachers and the administrators that I talk to, um, there's some solace in having the kids come into school because they can actually glean information from them and understand how to intervene and how to protect. Right. And you don't have that necessarily. So they're, they're finding different ways of doing it like we all are. They're, they're doing it you know, on the telephone. They're checking in um, via video chat. They're trying other ways to get into, um, into the home and give people a chance to share with any concerns they may have. Yeah, so, so difficult. I mean, we've learned a lot about Zoom. I mean, the, the word Zoom is going to... Uh, be like Kleenex, for instance, uh, right. uh, a private brand that becomes a term. Uh, and we've all, we all know that those little Brady Bunch boxes only work for a certain age. Those little kids can't stay uh, centered on their screen long enough uh, to... <laughs> I don't know. I can tell you my three-year-old has class Zoom uh, that she sees all of her kids, and they do it. I mean, Amazing. they're pretty adaptive. Well, maybe I'm the one who's having trouble uh, standing yeah, I think it's the other end of the barbell we should be worried <laughs> yeah. about. <laughs> I, 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 I must say, uh, uh, 10 hours of that, and it's kind of, kind of crazy. So let's um, uh, talk a little bit about, we're, we touched a little bit on the socioeconomic issues around this. Uh, and then we're not talking about the, the, the economy shut down here, but I just talk about the, uh, how the poor people in our communities, uh, the less financially resourced people in our community are dealing with these things. Uh, I'd like to take that in two bites. The first is testing, and we mentioned that before we went on air. Uh, and the second is, what about uh, calling a doctor or, or something like that? I mean, a, little, a word about that, about sure. people um, don't have resources? Yeah, people that, that m under, under the misconception that New Canaan doesn't have a history or a problem with um, underprivileged that need services mm -hmm. are mistaken. For um, sure. We're fortunate in many respects, and we don't have nearly the impact that the cities are having around us. Um, but New Canaan certainly has a portion of the population that requires assistance, and that's what we're here to do. So um, with respect to testing, um, everybody should feel as if they're able to get tested if they need to get tested. The only gating factor right now to get tested should be if you have symptoms or not. It should not be whether or not you have private insurance, um, pay as you go, or Medicare or Medicaid, um, or no insurance. Yeah. Um, so what we're asking people to do, if you are looking to get tested, um, complete the application uh, forms online at coronatestct.com. And um, we will work with uh, Dr. Murphy's office to make sure everybody gets tested. Um, if there's any questions or concerns, they can always shoot me an email, and I'll make sure it gets through the health department and we get you tested. Well, that's quite a bold thing to shoot you an email since you get something like 200 emails a day. Uh, right. uh, just to say that there is access to this. Now, what about the second question? Uh, I know because we have the New Canaan Food Pantry uh, located down below the floor that we're sitting on now. And uh, when I first came, the stock market crashed and the number of uh, clients in the food pantry soared uh, in this town that is known for its wealth, has a, has a very large number of people who use our food pantry. Uh, sure. And not only for food, but what if somebody needs a doctor, for instance, and they don't, they don't, uh, they don't feel well? The, we hear that the first thing to do if you don't feel well is to be in touch with your physician. There are people that do not have physicians. Is there some protocol that's coming out in place for people either don't have physicians or are worried they can't, they can't pay the, the, the freight? So there are um, Connected Health Centers, as an example. There are organizations that we've taken upon ourselves to actually equip with personal protective equipment to make sure that they're on the front lines and able to continue to serve their population. There are organizations like that that I think serve close to 140,000 Connecticut residents um, that are in some form of financial um, need. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, the majority, of, the vast majority of people that don't have primary health care use the hospitals as their primary right. health care. Right. Um, I don't think that's necessarily changing, although we encourage mm -hmm. you to be very selective about when you go to a hospital. Um, but certainly, um, New Canaan EMS uh, is, is available free of charge, has never charged for patients to be transported to the hospital. Um, so if people are in need of care, now is not the time to avoid getting care. Yes. So um, to the extent that you cannot avail yourself of some of the you know, organizations that serve the underprivileged in Connecticut, then you're going to be using your hospital as your primary care. Um, again, not ideal. But again, we want you to make sure you get care. So um, if you are in need of health care um, and it's emergent, everybody should feel as if they're able to call 911. They will not be charged. Anybody will be charged to be taken to the hospital. 
Um, if it's not emergent, then you can give the health department or give us a call and we can figure out how we can help you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. You know, uh, some weird statistics coming out. I mean, one of which is the number of heart attacks have gone down uh, during this time. And one of the questions was some wondering if people did not want to go to the hospital, so they weren't reporting things. I, I mean, I have no idea how to, if there's any comment on that. Just, yeah, uh, I, I can know. tell you anecdotally, um, we see on you know, Christmas, for example, there's very few emergency medical calls. Okay. But the day or two after Christmas, there are a lot of medical calls. And that's because people don't want to, you know, disrupt their family celebration by going to an emergency room and they kind of just ignore the symptoms or they're just, you know, not paying attention closely. And then when you ask them, you know, how long have you had chest pain? They say, oh, it's been three or four days. You're like, okay. Um, I think it's only natural that, um, and I hope people are taking down their risk behavior right now. Yes. Um, I can tell you with five kids, we are very consciously aware of what our kids are doing <clears throat> because, you know, a, you know, a, Accidental fall on the stairs, you know, two months ago was just a trip to the orthopedist and get your, your, your legs set. Now it becomes a much bigger deal. Yeah. So I do think we are seeing dramatically reduced non-COVID-related medical injuries um, and, and illness, which is good. Bad news is our call volume isn't going down because we're filling it up with all the COVID-related illness. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you for that. Let's switch gears here a little bit. Uh, when we uh, first started uh, five sessions ago, a month ago, one of the first things you said was, this is a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, and and now, I've, I've, now I've now said it's not a marathon, it's a triathlon. Uh, and another thing you said was, uh, we like to give people, uh, you know, my job, this me speaking for you, your job is to give people honest information about what you know, uh, unvarnished one way or the other. And one of the things you said is, I do not like to be in the position of having to move the goalpost. People right. don't like that. And so uh, we got a lot of goalposts moving uh, as the kinetics of this begins to unfold. The governor has spoken this week about changing uh, times around when schools and restaurants can reopen. I wonder if you might just talk about time and the moving of the goalposts. Sure. The challenge that everybody faces from the president to the governor to the mayor's first yeah. selectman all the way down to the rest of us um, is that this is not about picking a date and time and you know, setting, you know, trying to get the team ready to get on the field to play. Right. There is a lot that has to happen before this economy can really get back to some semblance of a fraction of what it used to be. Um, I think, um, and we've talked about this for weeks now, and my fear is that we're not much closer today than we were the last time we spoke about it, um, but testing is really the primary focus right now and should be the primary focus. If you look at what we've tested in town, um, it's a mere fraction of those that may or may not have been uh, exposed to this virus, I yes. hope. Um, so I think, I think we're not going to get there. You know, I think a vaccine, I think, let's, let's just refresh what we talked about in prior weeks. Right? So we talked about the need for a vaccine. That's yep. effective. Um, I'm not working on that. No one in town is working on that. That's right. probably, I don't know, nine to... 15 months away at so, best. Okay, so just, I'm going to pause you because as we go through these pieces, a vaccine yep. 9 to 15 months away. Uh, we're in April now, so 9 to 15 months away. We're, uh, 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 you know, Christmas time in the Christian calendar sort of thing. I know that the NCAA has started to speak about maybe they would play their football season in the spring. NCAA hoops might not start until after Christmas. So anyway, we got a vaccine issue that is... A long yeah. way away. And, and that okay, vaccine is critical, right? So, um, it, but it's not the only thing that can help us restart the economy. Okay, so that, that would be the optimal yeah, solution. Yeah, okay, that's one. Let's go through the um, number so two. So therapeutic antiviral, so treatments. So yeah, treatments. what that means is people that um, do get exposed, do have pre-existing conditions, it's not a death sentence. It doesn't mean that you're automatically going to have a really bad outcome. There are things they can do to minimize that mortality rate. Yeah. And again, there are a lot of experimental drugs that everyone's talking about on TV nothing really has been proven to be as effective as people want it to be. So that's the second aspect that needs to happen. And, and uh, I, I know there's been a lot of conversation about uh, uh, malaria drugs and things like that. And, sure. But, uh, and, and that's a, is that a, a public-private partnership uh, working on this or public-private? So I everybody's every, working on Everybody's private. working on it. Everybody's, everybody's working, everybody's on, working on therapeutics. Yeah. Um, okay. And again, there's probably no one single therapeutic that's going to prove effective. There'll probably be a combination. I think right now um, all eyes have been on existing therapeutics to be adaptively reused for this illness. Oh, um, we haven't started to roll out new therapeutics just for this. So that's going to happen at some point also. Yeah. The third thing that needs to happen, and we're already there, thankfully, is capacity. Right, so we talk about um, 
people die of the flu, and why is this so dramatically different? Most people that die of the flu don't die of the flu or succumb to the flu because there's a lack of a hospital bed or treatment or capacity in the hospital to treat them. Yeah. Um, that was not the case two or three weeks ago. Um, this is very mm -hmm. different. Uh, I think if you were to go into Stanford Hospital or Norwalk Hospital, um, I think they would tell you that we have the capacity necessary now to treat people. It doesn't mean they're not operating you know, at 9,000 RPMs on the right. cars redlining. Um, they're still way overtaxed in terms of the people they have that they have to treat. Um, I think nationwide, in terms of ventilators, um, where we sit today is dramatically different than we were three or four weeks ago. I think there probably are enough, and I don't want to say this like I have definitive answers, but I think we probably are at the point where we have enough ventilators in our country to treat those who need it, provided they can be moved from location to location in a timely fashion. So I think you're already seeing that happen, and I think at some point when this wave um, passes Connecticut, and we're not there yet, but when we actually start to depress that curve to where we can actually handle the capacity in our hospitals and we can ship some of those ventilators to the next hotspot, um, I think they'll start feeling a little bit better prepared to handle what's about to come their way. So I don't think um, we're as in dire need of ventilators as we had before, um, but that's a good thing. That's because we actually, you know, on two fronts, we slowed down the spread of the virus dramatically. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we, also, curve. and we also dramatically increase the number of ventilators that we had available, so that's good. Um, the fourth thing, and that's probably the most important thing to me right now, is testing. Yeah. So uh, right now, exclusively, the testing that we've been doing has been a polymerase chain reaction, which is a PCR test that tests for viral load, So, which is why we tell you if you're asymptomatic, the odds of you testing positive are very, very slim. It uh, doesn't mean you haven't been exposed to it, or you may not have it. It just means you ha don't have enough of a viral load for the test to detect it. Um, that's not what we're looking for. That's very clinically important in a hospital. If you go into an ICU, they now have rapid testing to get you a PCR test back within minutes, mm -hmm. which is great, but it's not going to tell you if you've been exposed. And the reason why the exposure is important is because there should be some embedded immunity in the community. Mm -hmm. We just don't know it. So um, again, I'm not an epidemiologist, mm -hmm. but I think it's important to note that uh, we can't really start school again or restart the s society with it, unless we want to take an enormous amount of risk. I mean, we could do it, just we'd be taking a lot of risk that as many people as we think are exposed or have not been exposed and develop some natural immunity to it, and we'll see that spike pick right back up and overflood our hospitals again. So um, could we reopen the economy tomorrow? We probably could. Um, I personally think there'd be enormous risk and we'd be right back in the exact same spot we have been for the last four weeks. So it would just lead to a prolonged uh, closure of the, of, the, of the economy once again. So I think everybody that is rational about this um, understands and, and takes into account the financial impact of, and the economic ruin this is doing to everybody up and down the spectrum. But I think they're also balancing the fact that we want to keep people healthy and safe. So um, until we have a combination of those four things, it's reckless to open the economy just blindly and hope it's going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you for going through that. Really beautifully done. I wonder, uh, on, okay, so that's where we are. Now let's just review again uh, what we, the, the, you know, the, the common Joe and Josephine can do. Okay, so we're stay home, stay safe. We're washing our hands like maniacs. We're squirting our hands with stuff. Uh, just, could you just review uh, what, what, you, what you want us to do? Uh, what do you want us to do yes, or so, not do? So nothing has changed. Um, there should be no social gathering. There should be no play dates, no neighbors coming over for barbecues. There should be, you should be isolating with your family at home and only leaving your home for essential needs. Food, medications. There may be other things I'm missing, uh, but those are really the things that jump out as being the most essential items that need, people need to go out and get. And to the extent that we can provide them for you and deliver it to you, we ask you to avail yourself of that service um, because we'd rather keep our seniors and vulnerable citizens home, yep. not because we're being disrespectful to your freedom, but because we really know that that is the safest place for you to be. Um, I'll tell you something else that's a challenge, and certainly today is no exception. Um, one of the things that we find is, you know, and it's hard not to get caught up in it, but you know, the stock market goes up 700 points in a day, you feel really good all of a sudden for some reason, right? And the sun comes out and it's beautiful out, and you say, wow, this looks like a beautiful, you know, gorgeous 60 degree Easter Sunday, why can't we go out and enjoy ourselves with our friends? It's, it's tempting, right? It really does trick your mind into thinking that things are better than they really are. I can tell you on, behind the scenes, nothing has changed. Mm. Uh, people are still getting sick, they're still having really poor outcomes, 
um, and we're still losing residents. Uh, and that's not going to change um, until we actually get better therapeutics. But the rate of increase will stay constant or decline, hopefully, if we continue to do what we're doing. Let's talk about what it means for our town to do what we've been doing. Okay, so it's, it's hard. And I'll tell you something else that um, someday I'm going to do this. It just hasn't happened yet, not for lack of effort on my part or our team's part, and not for lack of requests from the public. Um, I get no satisfaction in sharing mortality rates with people every mm, night, yeah. none whatsoever. Um, I would love nothing more than to be able to share success stories. Uh, we've had some really um, horrific experience. Uh, and it's not for a lack of trying on my part. I talk with the ICU and ER staff at both hospitals, Norwalk and Stanford, regularly. I am desperately searching for a success story in New Canaan. Somebody that's gone into the hospital, been on a ventilator, come off a ventilator successfully, and gone home to be their family. Um, unfortunately and sadly, we don't have that yet. Mm. It's not that I'm holding it back from everybody. When we do have that, I will share it with you, and I'll be happy to share it. I'll share it with you three times if you want. We just don't have it. Um, so I think it's important that people realize that even though our data sample is really small, it's a really grim data sample. Yeah. Um, so just to give you some rough numbers, and I, it's, the numbers are important because it really does show, um, if you look into the data a little more carefully, how great a job New Canaan is actually doing and how much we all appreciate the flattening of the curve that we're getting in New Canaan. So I think uh, based on last night's numbers, we have about 112 residents, uh, residents or people connected with the town in one way or another that have tested positive for COVID-19. Now remember, it's not really representative of the true population because you can only get tested if you're showing symptoms. Right? So people that were sick in December and January that didn't know they were sick never got tested because right. the test didn't exist, and they got better, and they may be home with some immunity to this that we don't know about. Um, but of the prior 49 tests of New Canaan residents done by Murphy Associates, mostly in other towns' testing sites, of those 49 residents, 20% of them came back positive. So, and it's, I'm not saying we can extrapolate anything out from that data to show you what the true uh, illness in the population is going to be, because it's just too small a data sample. But, you know, those are concrete numbers. 20% of the 49 people that got tested, tested positive. Yeah. Um, of the 112 positive cases that we've had since inception, we've lost 12, re uh, yeah, 12 residents. Is that right? Yeah, 12 residents. So, um, that's a very high mortality rate. You're not going to see that when you test broadly throughout the community that you have a 10% mortality rate. We know that's not going to be the case. Right. Our denominator is just not big enough. Yep. Now, um, of the 112 positive cases, I can probably draw a ring around half of them being associated with uh, three group gatherings um, in oh, New Canaan. Wow. Now, not all of it's nefarious. Some of it's Waveney Care Center, unfortunately. Some of it's Silver Hill Hospital, unfortunately. Um, some of it's the men's club. There's, there's clusters that we can draw a direct line and contact trace to a couple of groups that had a direct impact on a greater number of people. Now, that is um, not surprising. There isn't a nursing home in the country that doesn't have a case that isn't spreading throughout, so we have to put that in perspective. Hospitals have it. Nursing staff, doctors are all sick. Um, it's not surprising. Uh, EMS has it. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. Um, but if you look at what separates out a social gathering or a communal living with general society, it's the fact that we are together. <laughs> That's the only thing that separates the, the two different groups out, right? So I, I do believe that our population at large would look very much and resemble the statistics of what you see from a Waveney Care Center or a Silver Hill Hospital or a hospital or, you know, a group of people that work together as essential workers, that population statistics will look exactly like the general population. I see. Because yeah. the only thing that's separate is they're not together, eating together, you know, shopping together, being out together, um, going to weddings, going to churches, going to things that they would normally be doing. So the fact that we're seeing a heavy concentration of illness among two, three, or four groups that we know are existing because they have to tells me that the other... You know, the mainstream population is doing a very, very good job social distancing. And that's great. Um, it's not that it's cut it to zero. There's still half the cases are popping up in the community. And I can tell you, you know, you are exposing yourself going grocery shopping. But yes. we're okay with that risk because you have to go grocery shopping. 
If, if it weren't food, if we were going to buy magazines, we would not let you go buy magazines because that is not essential. So you, you know you're being exposed, which is why we're asking people to wear a face covering, wash your hands. Um, we've provided a lot of per personal protective equipment to people that never even knew what that existed before um, in grocery stores, um, and we're urging them to wear it. Some are, some aren't. Um, so do I think this is working? Undoubtedly this is working, not just in New Canaan, but nationwide, it's definitely working. Um, I think New Canaan has done a great job, and if we haven't said thank you, we should, because flattening this curve um, removes a lot of stress and strain on the people that are charged with taking care of you when you get really sick. And as I mentioned before, that is a position I never want to put somebody in, ever. Yeah. Um, being able to have the skill to treat someone, but not having the equipment or the opportunity to treat someone is a horrible feeling to put people that are charged with taking care of people. Well, thank you for that review. Of course, uh, you know, just it's just one of these things. I mean, for people sheltering at home, uh, they're you know, like the Waveney Life Care Network, that their home is in a community, right? And in fact, we move into communities for that exact reason, so our elders will be in community and not be lonely at home. Peter, one thing I also yeah. did mention that we're seeing a lot of, and it's going to continue, is positive cases in a household with other people. Yes. There's no way to keep them from getting sick. So as a father, um, if my kids were sick, Quarantining your kids sounds great in theory, but there's really no way to do it. And the average household is not equipped to take care of people in a, a quarantine setting. They need to eat, need to be cared for, medications. Um, you want to be with your kids when they're sick, or your parents, or your grandparents. Um, it's very tough. And I can tell you that we have seen homes where there are multiple infections, and it affects the families differently. The kids are usually doing okay, but not always. Um, but the older population is having a very, very tough time with this. So um, my advice to people at home, um, A, if you are sick, showing symptoms, isolate as much as you can in your house. I am fully aware of the fact that no home has separate ventilation systems for each room in the house. So you're going to have some community spread just by the fact that you're sharing air throughout the entire um, home. You know, make sure you're wearing gloves if you can when you're delivering food. Um, if people are not s that sick, leave the food at the door, let them come get the food, but really have them isolate as much as they possibly can. But also be prepared, you're going to get exposed. And as you know, professionals in the you know, medical community, we need to know that we're going to be treating multiple people in the house. Um, the days of thinking that you're going to be um, questioned about whether you traveled or know if you have it or not, those days are over. Yeah. Um, public safety assumes everybody's been exposed because pretty much everybody's been exposed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, go back to, uh, you know, the first case we had, Bill Pike, beloved member here. Uh, and when we found out that Bill had it, we traced all the people who'd been in contact with it. And now we have, met, we have several members with it and there's no tracing. I mean, there, there might be a, a right. feeling about it might have happened here and there. Uh, okay, uh, Jill, you want to uh, see what's coming in over the transom here, so to speak, and uh, answer some people's questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, a few questions, just to go back to where you were in the beginning, um, about wh what does restart look like? Um, someone asks, if I'm a decision maker for an organization, other than following government mandates, what are the other factors I should consider with respect to summer or fall programming to be safe rather than sorry? Yeah, that's a very tough question to answer. I think, um, A, you're not alone. If you run a summer camp, uh, you're not the only person who's in flux right now. This is impacting every business from the top of the food chain down to the bottom of the food chain, yeah. and no one's immune to it. Um, I think the best you can do is keep your employees healthy and safe. Um, the best you can do is keep um, checking in on people, making sure their mental health is, is okay, um, provide resources where you can. And, you know, I'm all for being optimistic. I'm also a realist. I think um, I don't object to the governor's um, delaying the school start incrementally, moving the goalposts one more time. Um, I think you saw the state um, delayed the reopening um, another month, and then New York City closed them for the rest of the school year. Um, I like to be optimistic. I like to think there's a chance we can get through this, but also just be aware that there's a chance schools don't open when we think they're going to open. Yeah. So I think for the summer, I think everything's going to be dramatically different. Um, I don't think you're going to see a meaningful restart Personally, I'm not planning for a meaningful restart um, in the summer months unless I'm really surprised um, to the upside in terms of where our testing capabilities are. Um, I can tell you that um, there are issues with some of the antibody testing. And 
people should also take into account that there's a lot of products being sold online. So we should talk about, you know, if you, if you Google, you know, serologic testing for COVID-19, uh, you'll probably get no more, uh, hundreds of companies want to sell you product from overseas that you can test for COVID-19. That's not what we're talking about. Um, imagine a pregnancy test. It doesn't matter to me if you know you're pregnant, I need to know you're pregnant. So this, the, the state, federal government, nationwide needs to understand what the rate of infection is for this to actually work. So taking a home test is not gonna be effective. It may be interesting information for you to have, but it's not what we're talking about when we talk about restarting the economy. We're talking about a nationwide understanding and appreciation for how much of our population has been exposed to COVID-19 and to what level. And then some epidemiologist is going to determine if that's enough to restart the economy, put people back in school. Um, again, there's good news in this. If our kids really are the vectors, which a lot of scientists believe that's the case, then they've been exposed and that's a very good sign. Um, if it's not enough, then we gotta figure out how we get to a vaccine really fast. So um, people that are planning for the summer, Jill, I think need to just appreciate that they can start planning. And if it comes to fruition, they're ready. If it doesn't come to fruition, then they wasted some time, but you know, it's good to be hopeful. Thank you. Fair enough. Um, so here's a question that has to do with uh, test results. Have any of the staff, food preparers, butchers, food handlers at the grocery stores um, contracted COVID-19 and would the public be informed if that were the case? Y yes, and uh, if you haven't been informed, I'm doing it now. Um, it's unrealistic to think that you know, everybody's got an equal chance of being exposed. Even if you wear the most efficient protective equipment, and I brought something with me that I wanna share with you in a few minutes. Um, even if you're wearing the gold standard of what personal protective equipment looks like, you still have to go home and you still have to get showered and get changed and go through your normal daily life outside of your work. So it should not surprise anybody that there are critical care nurses on ventilators right now in hospitals. It should, it's sad. Um, it should not surprise anybody that there are paramedics and EMTs that are testing positive. It should not surprise anybody that a grocery handler or somebody that's in um, at the checkout counter is going to test positive because they are putting themselves at risk. When we talk about essential workers, the only reason we're allowing them to take excessive risk is because they are deemed critical and essential to feeding all of us and taking care of all of us. So it should not be a surprise. We're not hiding it. Um, I think every grocery store in the country, every nursing home in the country, every corner of this earth is going to have a positive test in it, um, and it shouldn't scare you. Um, what we do when it happens in a grocery store is we ask, A, we're taking temperatures and we're, we're making sure that the staff are being monitored very closely. But remember, it's been proven you can shed this disease uh, three days prior to showing symptoms. So it's never going to be a perfect science, and for that reason, we're going to have it spread. We're willing to tolerate community spread in that environment because they're providing an essential service. So um, the first sign of any symptoms, temperatures, loss of sense of taste or smell, um, headache, um, lethargy, whatever the, whatever the symptoms are that you're exhibiting, the first sign you're being isolated and quarantined at home going, you're done, you're not coming to work another minute. Um, and then anybody that's been in touch, contact with them, we're monitoring those symptoms again. Uh, there's no way to stop community spread. That's why this is such a deadly illness because it really is very easily picked up and very easily spread. So um, no one's trying to hide anything. Um, I think, uh, and again, Waveney's done a good job of sharing exactly what's happening within their, their four walls, and it's, it's devastating, but it's happening everywhere. If we could push people out of nursing homes home, then we would have already done it. Um, hospitals have discharged all non-critical patients of people that could, could convalesce at home because they know that they're there, they're gonna be exposed to it. That's why when we talk about reducing risk in your homes, that broken leg becomes a much more, you know, a bigger issue because you're not going to the emergency room for an x-ray and you are being exposed. So um, it, it's not uncommon and no one should be surprised to understand there's infection happening in every area and every part of our, our society. And then so uh, to follow on that, to what extent is that a concern? How do you safely um, incorporate uh, food prepared by others uh, so into your daily life? I'll tell you what we do in our house. And again, I'm not speaking for everybody, but my, in our home, um, we generally eat food that is heated and cooked. Um, we generally discard the outer packaging of food. So I think I mentioned last time I was here that we have hand sanitizer in a box of gloves at our front door, and when FedEx or UPS or someone drops off a package, which we get plenty of, um, we'll put on gloves, we'll go out and we'll cut open the box, take out the outer box and take the inner box out. It's not perfect because you know the inner box has been packaged by somebody also. Uh, but we're trying to do everything we can to reduce risk without being totally you know, 
paranoid and focused and not being able to function. So you got to do what you can. And you always wash your hands when you're done touching something. Um, we try to cook our food at home, um, but we are availing ourselves of the, of the dining uh, that restaurants are providing by curbside. Um, but again, you got to just minimize every risk that you can take. So do we want to be signing uh, credit card slips at restaurants? No, it's unnecessary risk. Is it necessary? No. Um, do you have to take your food from somebody? Yes, that's essential. But you don't have to actually take the pen from them, sign the receipt, and hand it back to them. They can do that while you're watching them. Uh, so again, minimize the risk. Try not to get totally paranoid and lose perspective. Um, you're already doing a lot to help the overrun on the hospitals, and that's what this is all about. Okay, um, question from um, someone who is uh, first giving thanks that Wilton's so-called patient zero is now home off a ventilator and recovering. And that is a really big success story. So that was um, tragic, uh, really sick, and somehow managed to uh, wean himself off the ventilator and is home with his family. It's great. I assure you if that were a New Canaan resident, we'd be you know, talking about that every single day. They should talk about it a lot. Now, so this person um, says, uh, I was very sick at the end of November, tested negative for flu, but had all the same COVID symptoms, including fluid in the lungs, and wondering when um, an antibody test might be available for someone, you know, a middle-aged person. Sure. As soon as I know, you will know. <laughs> um, we are desperately trying to source um, that technology right now. And, and testing... Testing the community, testing the, the state, testing the nation is no easy feat, right? So uh, remember, we still have to do it in isolation, right? So you can't just have a thousand people come to Saks Middle School or the high school and say, stay in line, we're going to test you. You still have to be protective of everybody gathering. Um, it's also not just a scientific test production issue. It's got to be the scale, which is part of it. But then also it's the data collection. I mean, if you think about um, and let's talk about data real quickly, Jill, for one second. So um, I've probably gotten a dozen questions, and I've tried to respond to all of them. I put it up on Facebook last night. Uh, there's a discrepancy between the data that we report in town and the data that the state reports on behalf of New Canaan. And let's think about this, because um, it leads into the discussion about uh, antibody testing. We're having a really tough time in New Canaan um, keeping track of 112 positive cases and 12 fatalities. Um, with respect to the state counting the exact same 112 positive cases and 12 fatalities. And why is that? It's, the numbers aren't that big. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be that hard to get our head around 112 cases and 12 fatalities. The problem is the way they're reporting the testing um, and the results. So real quickly, um, when you go to your personal physician and they write a prescription for you to go to Norwalk Hospital or Stanford Hospital or Greenwich Hospital to get tested, I know nothing about it, right? You never called it. the health director, Jen Eilson, and I have no knowledge of you going to get tested. So that's just done in your private physician. You go to the hospital, you get tested, and then the results go back to your prescribing doctor. That doctor is required to call the state with a positive result, not the negative, just the positive. Mm -hmm. That positive goes up to the state, and the state then in turn is supposed to, um, through Jen Eilson, our local health director, notify us that we've got a positive case in our community. Then we do the contact tracing and make sure we isolate and quarantine whoever has been in contact with them. That's the way the process is supposed to work. But a lot of our doctors have relationships with us and with Jen, where the patients call us and say, I just tested positive today. They, they, go, they get the results back today and say, hey, I got positive tests today. Great. If I sit back and wait for the state to call me through the normal channels, I may never get that result, or it may take a week to get that result. But I want to share with you the most uh, up-to-date information that we have, so I put that on our tally that day, because we know it's a confirmed positive case in New Canaan. That's one reason why we have a problem. The other problem can be, you know, if you go to Murphy Associates for testing, you're signing up through us, so we know who's testing. That data, the reason why I said 49 people tested um, and 20% uh, were positive, because I had 100% of that data. I get the positives and the negatives because we're doing the prescribing, right? So Dr. Murphy's the one writing the prescriptions. That data is valuable. I have no way of knowing if there's 10,000 people getting doctor's notes and getting tested at the hospitals, and only 50 are getting positive results, I would never know the negatives. So that's why the data is very tough to come by. The other issue we have is some people live in New Canaan, but for tax reasons, also have residences in Florida, and that's their primary residence. So I have no doubt that some is here for five months and 29 days a year, test positive in New Canaan, I'm counting them. But when the state looks at their home address for tax purposes, I have no doubt Florida's counting them. And, you know, again, technically, should we let the state count them as a Florida resident? Probably, but we're the ones doing the contact tracing. They're the ones that are communicating spreading the disease throughout New Canaan. So we're taking care of that management here. 
And I think people should know that. So that's part of it. On top of that, you look at Silver Hill and Waveney Care Center. Those are people that are living in our town, but their home address may be Wilton or New York or somewhere else. And when they test positive, do we count them as our resident or their resident? I'm trying to share with the community 100% of what we know is happening in our town to give them the mm -hmm. best information to make decisions. Um, and that's kind of the, the lion's share. A lot of it's going to be a timing issue. Um, not something I want to talk about um, often, but it's kind of morbid to discuss. But there's very little testing uh, post-mortem being mm -hmm. done. Right. And that's because there aren't enough tests available. But there are cases where I can point to where we did post-mortem testing. It came back positive. I counted that person as a fatality, but the state knows nothing about it yet. Yeah. They will in a week, and that data will catch up. So the data is tough to come by. Absolutely. Um, so a couple of questions about you know, people just wanting to know how to conduct themselves appropriately. Um, what about dogs? OK, so if you pet a dog that's been around other people, what's the risk of the fur? So I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a doctor. I'm also not a veterinarian. Um, I've read the same literature people have said that obviously it does spread among cats because there's, a, I think, a lion or a tiger that tested positive. I know nothing about whether or not it responds to dogs and how it's shared. I will tell you, and this is what people love to share with me um, at all hours of the night, um, because there are more people out walking their dogs, please pick up after your dogs. That's what I get um, usually at 2 in the morning. The people realize they can't take any more. They email me saying no one's picking up after their dogs. So please do that. Um, while we're talking about walking, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask people to, I think I've said it before, um, walk against oncoming traffic and bike with oncoming traffic. And I want to say this. I'd like to see the same for sidewalks also. I would like to see one-way traffic on sidewalks on South Avenue, for example, so you're not coming in contact with people you know, crossing paths. And it's not that hard to do. Sidewalks notwithstanding, walk towards traffic, automobile traffic and bike away from uh, traffic in the same direction as traffic, I guess, is what you would say, right? Yeah, that, that, you, you preempted one of the questions I was just going to ask. Okay. Um, related to that, um, you know, someone asks, since the parks are closed, so groups don't gather on the fields, then also the walking trails are closed. Um, people are walking in the streets. It's crowded. It's dangerous with cars. Um, is there any thought to potentially just opening the walking trails without the fields? Can I tell you how much this affects me? It's not even silly. So um, I'm aware of every uh, emergency call in town. And yesterday, we had a bicyclist struck by a car. And I, I am always concerned to see someone get struck by a car. But uh, in my mind, I'm always balancing, are we doing the right thing by closing our parks? Um, and I know, unfortunately, um, it's just wood, it's only a matter of time that we're going to have a, a catastrophic accident in our streets. So do I think it's still the right decision? Yes. I implore people to please drive carefully. Please, there's no reason to be in a rush to go anywhere right now. No one's rushing to go to a meeting, rushing to get to work. Um, everyone needs to just take a deep breath and slow down and be aware that there are more people out. Um, and to the extent that you can find places to walk um, that are safer and not winding streets and hills, I would encourage you to do that. Um, we are not contemplating, we, I mean, we think about it every day. No decision has been made to open anything up yet because it sends probably the wrong message to the community. Um, and also, if we open up our trails and our parks or any part of our parks, I certainly uh, suspect it would bring residents from other neighboring towns who are used to enjoying our amazing parks and fields in town back into New Canaan. That's the last thing we want to see in terms of community spread. Uh, question also about reducing the spread. Uh, so the advice is now we're all to wear face masks um, and gloves when we go out. So a lot of this is hard to come by. Um, suggestions? Yes. Um, let's talk about just for a second, I'm going to go beyond that question just a little bit. So personal protective equipment. Um, I think we talked weeks prior to this, um, what we did locally to protect our first responders to make sure that they had everything they would need throughout this entire pandemic. And that was done with a lot of help from a lot of people in our departments that really jumped on the ball early and acquired what we needed to acquire. So that's great. So everyone should know all of our first responders have everything they need to take care of all of you in the community, and they'll be safe. Um, doesn't mean they're not exposed, not at risk, but they're going to be as safe as they possibly can be. I brought with me um, one mask in particular, and this is the gold standard of what healthcare professionals should be using on the front lines. This is a 3M N95 Model 1860, and it's one of the few, if not the only, masks that actually protects against vapor um, going through the mask. 
It's different than the other 3M N95s that protect against dust and particles going through. This actually protects against vapor, and this is a droplet borne, uh, has been proven to be. Um, Can you hold that up so they might see it there? Yeah. yeah. So it's not, nothing very special. It just happens to be um, green in color. Is that blue? What color is that? Uh, yeah, green. Green. Green in color, <laughs> uh, but this is the gold standard. And when we started this um, effort with Grace Farms, who have done an amazing job, along with our volunteer fire company number one, distributing stuff throughout the entire state now, um, we always suspected that someday the cavalry would come running in with all these to provide everybody, and they haven't yet. Um, so we are still providing, uh, I think we've, we're, we're north of 600,000 pieces of personal protective equipment distributed to all of Fairfield County, now beyond Fairfield County. Um, but this is not for you at home. So um, when they talk about um, healthcare workers wearing masks and wearing face shields, wearing gloves, wearing gowns, um, that is to protect the healthcare worker from getting exposed from you. Um, when we ask you to wear a mask when you go to the grocery store, that's not to keep you safe. That's to keep you from spreading anything to somebody else. So this quality of mask, and, and one of the concerns about giving masks out to the public is that we still direly, direly need them for our healthcare workers is it, it just creates more demand on a scarce product for our healthcare workers. So um, I will tell you that um, cloth masks, and I'm in touch with uh, companies that make apparel for a living, their normal day jobs, they've all reached out. One in particular has reached out about in, being interested in supplying um, cloth masks to the entire town. Wow. And we're working on, on that project right now. Um, right now, Bandanas, homemade cloth masks, whatever you can find, that's not a surgical mask um, or not an N95 in particular is probably what I would recommend. At some point, we will procure enough uh, surgical masks to provide to everybody when it's appropriate. Uh, but right now, what I worry about is um, people thinking that because they have a mask on, they're protected. The mask does nothing to protect you. It's to protect others from getting sick from you. We're assuming you're sick. So um, right now, stay home. You shouldn't need a mask. If you're going to the grocery store, by all means, you can put a mask on, um, wash your hands as often as you can, but stay home. Once it's okay to re-engage society in some whatever the new normal way is going to be, we'll provide masks to everybody so they can do that. And I think that there are good instructions on the CDC website for how to make a mask by sewing or not sewing or out of a t-shirt. Sure. Okay, uh, thanks, Jill. All I can think of was when I was a boy and we used to play cowboys. I don't know if people do that anymore. We would put those bandanas around us yep. and run around our yards with cap guns. Uh, I love that look, and perhaps I'm going to have to rock that uh, in the days to come. Uh, I have one. We got one more because we're running one with a lot of. Here. It's not. It, it's just a comment yeah. from someone for whom I know it's quite a genuine comment. Back to the cyclists, wear a helmet. Yes, oh, that boy. comes with the. Uh, the reducing risk, please wear a helmet. Yes. I'd like to say that a thousand fold. We don't have time for me to, t I used to be a cyclist, to tell my crazy cyclist stories about people who fall without helmets. Wear a helmet. I couldn't agree more. Uh, as we wrap it up here, just a few uh, words here. Uh, I want to uh, have a shout out uh, to Tom Chickalese and the folks uh, at the Hoyt Funeral Home, our local funeral home, and to say, uh, uh, keep these workers in your prayers. Sometimes uh, these are the people who are forgotten in our community until they're in need, until you need them. You find out from Hoyt that these people have a calling uh, and a ministry, as we use the language that we use in our church here, uh, and, and these bodies are still, uh, expo they're still exposed through dead bodies. So uh, prayers, prayers and, and, and well, well thoughts for those guys. Uh, also, I do want to say, and as the bell rings here on our, our Easter chime outside, uh, I don't know if everybody out there in TV land knows, Mike's actually a volunteer, uh, which is shocking. He actually has a job that is not taking care of all of us. Uh, and so, uh, and Mike, your job has a lot to do with numbers. And so uh, one of the reasons you're so astute and uh, with the data and understanding that. So we are, we are mightily thankful to you, to your whole team, uh, which is too big to name. Uh, and we're thankful to everybody out there who's doing the right stuff. And so let's all keep doing the right stuff. Uh, and in whatever way you can do it, uh, say your prayers, send your happy uh, feelings to your neighbors, zoom away, uh, and we'll see you next Sunday morning. Sunday mornings with Mike, 9 o'clock. We're really, really thankful to you for taking the time to talk to all of us. It's been my pleasure. Stay yeah. healthy, please. Okay, you too. Yeah. Peace, everybody.